you want to be thinking about people who are going to have a bias for solving the issue. And it doesn't mean that you don't communicate. It doesn't mean you don't read people in and bring in the right team members and do all that work. It's not an individual thing. It's a it's a mindset that you're looking for. It's not a I own this and I'm only going to do this and I alone can solve this. It's not that. But it is what is that bias for getting it done, getting the right people in the room and figuring it out, setting a course and going. Hi, I'm Nick Warner. As a dad, a lucky husband, and as a business coach, I value people and relationships above all else. But next is winning, sustainability, and healthy culture. I've been a business owner for 25 years and served for decades as a special advisor to business and government leaders at all levels. Let's just say I've seen some stuff. My passion and my expertise are helping motivated professionals and businesses find the highest level confluence of what they want in life and business. This is what it feels like to be together at the top. Before we begin, I'd like to thank my sponsors, Shoals Brick and Rogaski, OM Incorporated, Three Bridges Consulting, and Kathy Olson at Ships and Trips Travel. Also, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Enjoy the show. If you listen to episode four, you know Anthony Williams comes from humble roots and has earned everything he has achieved. Anthony Williams has worked at the highest levels of just about every pillar of our democratic society. Judiciary branch for the California Chief Justice, Chief of Staff to the State Senate, Cabinet Secretary to a Governor, Managing Partner of a successful law firm, stints at Boeing, and now Policy Director for Amazon. Add in UC Davis, McGeorge Law School, and a Harvard MBA, and you understand well why we're having Anthony back for take two. Where are you today, Anthony? And say hello to the people together at the top. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me, Nick. Uh, It's great to be back with you and your audience. I am at home in Huntington Beach. Uh, We had a little bit of rain yesterday, but it's beautiful and sunny here today. So uh, I'm enjoying uh, the great Southern California sun. Very good. Well, I will tell you, admittedly, I'm part nervous and part super excited about this interview. I'll start with in pre-production. I got lucky when you started thinking out loud I took notes as fiercely as I could when, for example, you started talking about the industrial economy becoming a digital or internet economy and what you're seeing post-pandemic. For context, research site IAB.com reports, quote, the internet economy's contribution to the U.S. gross domestic product grew 22% per year since 2016 in a national economy that grew between 2 and 3% per year. Since IAB began measuring the economic impact of the internet in 2008, the internet's contribution to GDP has grown eightfold from $300 billion to $2.45 trillion. What are you experiencing overall in the change from industrial to digital economy? Yeah, it's something I've been geeking out a lot about, Nick, lately. You gave a little bit of my background. You know, people were we're hearing that they hear a person who's been involved in politics, who's studied political science, uh, slight correction. I have a master in public policy, not the MBA, although, you know, um, I, I like to think of it as the, the public version of the MBA and a law degree. So why would a person who has that background and those credentials be interested in science and things like just, you know, human behavior and, and to some degree economics, although it's a little bit related so I, I've been kind of watching and reading a couple of books I could I highly recommend. If folks haven't read it, I'd be hard, it'd be hard to believe that a lot of folks haven't because they've sold so many, but Sapiens by Duval Noah Harari. He wrote a fascinating book about human history. Another book that I highly recommend is Enlightenment Now by Steven Pinker, who sort of chronicled the history. Um, and he has a, another book, um, The Better Angels of Our Nature, But both of those books together kind of chronicled human history and how the economy has changed, how we've moved from, you know, hunter gatherers to an agrarian society, from an agrarian society to an industrial society, and now from an industrial society to a more digital economy, right, and society where things are shifting, how we work and where we work and the kind of jobs that exist. And at each point in those changes in history, there's been human conflict things that have happened, you know, people having a difficult time adjusting to to those things. And so I've been sort of paying attention to that because we are, I think, at the hinges of that now, as you pointed out, how the economy is changing, how the, you know, the internet has has changed our lives so much. 
how we, as much as we are connected, there can be this overwhelming sense that we are disconnected as individuals. And so it's just been a fascinating thing for me to just kind of watch and pay attention to some of it. You know, we are recording this on the day after an election where, you know, I think the American people across the board, states across the country, here locally, kind of spoke up as individuals. And it was really interesting to see how it wasn't Democrat or Republican. There was no wave on either side, how people just kind of made choices based on what they're experiencing in life right now. You asked me, what am I experiencing? And, you know, I hope that kind of gives you a sense of just what I've sort of been paying attention to and, and what's been fascinating me lately. Absolutely. There's so many external factors at play from inflation to international unrest. You mentioned yesterday's divided elections or we thought would be more divided elections. How do you smooth that out as a manager, especially when you're working inner circle with the biggest governments and companies on the planet? Or is that even part of your job? Well, you have to pay attention to it, right, Nick? Because we are all human beings in human interactions. We can't ignore how folks may be feeling and what anxieties they may have, what may be exciting them at, at any given time, how you know, we may be seeing and evaluating the world different. So just to kind of bring it to brass tacks, I mean, as a manager, I work with, I have, you know, the luxury and, and, and fortune to work with some really talented people um, who are at different levels in their careers. So uh, we have some folks who are, who have been uh, working in, you know, politics and government and business for quite some time, they're very experienced and, how I might interact with them will be very different than a very junior person on this team who's just coming in, who's, you know, who may be younger and who sees the world very differently. And it's, it's, you got to manage all of them. You have to bring the best out of all of them. You have to provide leadership, support, guidance, whatever it may be, coaching and how you approach coaching a very seasoned manager versus a, you know, junior individual contributor who's coming in to their career new. Uh, who has a very different perspective, who's gone through the pandemic, who sees the relationship between their life and their work very differently. And how do you still bring out the best in those folks? So it's, I mean, it's been a challenge. It's a real time challenge right now that I'm thinking about and, and working on and trying to figure out how to draw on my past experiences that again, are very different. I think I had my first management job in the early 2000s. And man, how much it has changed from then to now, right? It's, it's pretty incredible. Without question. Let's talk about politics at work. And I don't mean politics at work, like how do I ingratiate myself with my boss or this faction's fighting and I need to figure that out. I mean real politics at work because politics are impacting people, as you point out, in really poignant ways. How do you deal with real politics at work, including social media, someone bringing up diverse viewpoints or poor taste political humor in a team meeting? I'm sure you're seeing it. Most of us are. How do you think about it? How do you deal with that? I will say that one of the things I am encouraged about, just having spent a few decades on on this earth and and in this country and seen, you know, some pretty difficult times and gone through even some recent times that were awakening in a way. And what I'm seeing almost across the board is a lack of tolerance for a lack of tolerance, if that makes sense, right? It's like people are willing to speak up and when they see something or, or you know, just uh, have an issue, a concern about people not being accepted. And there's, a, there's obviously across the board to people want to call it wokeness, whatever they want to call it. I, I, don't, I don't think that's a bad thing for people to just like pay more attention to other people and how they uh, express themselves in their lives. But that that shows up in the workplace. It shows up in just being aware of our language, having to learn a lot about ourselves. I, again, come from a, a you know what you might call a different generation, and there may be things that I have difficulty adjusting to, admittedly, that folks, a younger person on my team might remind me, like, that's not appropriate. And I, and I think it's great that, that people are willing to, to have the courage to do that, and that I am apparently providing the space to do that because that's a big thing too. You really have to provide the space for your folks to feel comfortable raising things and and speaking up because it improves the overall environment. It improves people, you know, 
people who are happy at work are, are more are more productive. They're contributing more. They the more bought into the mission, and so you just you have to create that environment for that to happen. We have two questions about that. One is, what did the person or a people approach you on that you're getting wrong? Where you need to clean up a attitude, a speak, a joke. What's an example of work that kind of snapped your head back? Yeah, and I'm not sure it's actually. I mean, obviously, you know, I try to stay away from you know off color jokes, and although you know, I mean, nobody's perfect. It's, it's, say something stupid or you laugh at something that you, you know, in hindsight, you realize is problematic. But I am at the same time that I think our society is dealing with or not dealing with, but but becoming more aware of and more accepting of people who, you know, my I, I have a child who uh, is trans. And this has been like in the last year, where they have expressed to us, I prefer he, they, I don't want to be referred to as she, but they're about to be 14 years old. And that's been my whole life of referring to them as my daughter and she, and, you know, making that transition. So, and even talking to, talking about them in the workplace, like, oh, how are you? And how many kids do you have? And, and then somebody will hear and say, hey, wait, you mean he, they, yeah. You know, it's like getting that right and like drilling that into our heads is not easy. I'm just, I just have to admit it. It's not easy, even with my own child. And I can imagine what it's like for a, you know, a, a manager who's not accustomed to it, who doesn't have that personal experience at home. It's tough. But I, the advice that I would give is to have what someone once said to me in a meeting years ago, he was a bank president who was talking to one of his, his, his general counsel, actually. And he said, two ears, one mouth, do more listening, and less speaking and judging, right? Like, just hear it. Don't react. Oh, well, you're going to force me to, don't force me to say this or do this. It's not about forcing you to say it or do it. It's about just showing you, right? And recognizing that there's no harm in allowing people to be who they are and to live who they are. And this is a big issue in the workplace. And it's going to be more of an issue as people in a very good way. And I go back to like, how we are progressing as humanity, we are allowing more people to be who they are. And that ultimately is a benefit. It's a benefit to the workplace, it's a benefit to society. It, it, it contradicts many things that we have been taught for many years, but the reality is, is that the more we allow our employees, our friends, our neighbors, our family members to be themselves, the happier they'll be and the happier those relationships will be. Yeah, I'd say amen to all that. Yeah. Especially the part where you have um, a trans child, you're as plugged into it, clued into it, trying as hard as you can to know you're having trouble finding the words. And then to juxtapose that with somebody who has no experience trying, that's difficult. And I appreciate you saying people aren't perfect. That's I think that's important to note. So the second part of my question was when you come across it, and I'll just back up for a minute to say, I'm guessing when you were in the judiciary, it was fairly homogeneous, but probably not completely in the Senate, much more homogeneous, meaning people are generally of the same minds or generally of the same team, and even the political party. But then you get to Boeing or Amazon where there's no way. I mean, it's international. It's every, you know, make size model it could possibly be. When you hear it, because I know you hear it, do you check the bad behavior? Do you pull the person aside? How do you deal with that in groups when you see it? And the it is intolerance or just unacceptable language, for example. Yeah, I, I mean, I have to say, Nick, I, I, I haven't seen it. I know, and I can't think of any example where something just really, maybe if I thought about it, I probably would come up with some examples where, where something was said that made me feel really uncomfortable. I didn't experience it in my time at Boeing. I haven't experienced it in my time at Amazon. I think by then, and you know, I got to Boeing in 2014, came to Amazon in 2020, there was a lot more tolerance. And, and again, it is not tolerated, right? Like it's very clear from a legal standpoint, from a training standpoint, like those things are very clear. What I have heard is people complaining about why do we have to do this? Like, why do we have to do this training or why do we have to do this thing? You know, this is, this is taking time away from what I really need to be doing to get my job done. Or now it's become, okay, here we go again. We got to go through this, you know, I actually, now that I think about it, Nick, you know, in any in any situation like that, you make a choice about whether you're going to confront somebody or something. You can't take on every battle, right? 
And as I think back on, you know, one example where someone was complaining about, you know, having to do some training, it might have been, you know, nice for me to say, well, you know, I think it's important and, you know, let's just do it. But I didn't, right? I didn't challenge it because it's not, this is not easy to challenge. Like we, we can all relate to hearing somebody say something and not responding. Um, one thing you can do is not contribute to it. Even if you're not challenging it, you're not saying, yeah, I know this is, this is bullshit, you know, because you want to fit into whatever's being said. But I'm fortunate that I haven't had more than that, more egregious than that comments being made. Um, I think we are well past that. And I think it's good. I think the bigger struggle is not expressing intolerance, but welcoming differences in a way that is genuine and, and meaningful, right, to the people who are wanting to contribute. They want to do a good job just like everybody else, but there's something about them that makes people feel uncomfortable because, fact, truth is, is it's not something folks are accustomed to. So I'm not saying anybody's a bad person, but growing to a place where we are genuinely and authentically recognizing folks for who they are and recognizing why we're there. And if they can do the job, they can do the job. Right. Yeah. What I like about that is like everything about that, but you're not an individual contributor anymore. You're a manager of a lot of people and have been for a long time. And so the way you're thinking about things, the way you're talking about things, I use the phrase conditioning the environment. It conditions the environment, both for people to come to you, as you pointed out and say, Hey, Anthony, maybe you should have or shouldn't have, or did you think about this? You mentioned that you have obviously created an environment where they felt comfortable enough. But some of the reasons you're not seeing these things is you're teasing it out at hiring. And I know companies like Amazon or even Boeing have science on hiring panels to tease out prejudices and, and behaviors and words like that. But also you're engendering and building teams around those kind of principles. And it's probably not an accident. Let's switch gears. Let's switch gears to um, remote office versus um, in the office. Just for context, Anthony, in February 2022, Forbes reported, quote, the world is experiencing a pandemic disruption that is changing our perspective and beliefs about how we work. In particular, the balance of power has shifted from employers to employees. The employee value proposition has shifted from work for me to work with me. Employees favor a hybrid model versus going back to the office full time. And employees are rethinking their purpose, meaning they're searching for meaning, not activity. In particular, millennials are interested in working with purpose-driven companies rather than those focused on shareholder values. So let's start with a remote versus in-office. And what are you seeing? What are you thinking? Any comments you have in that regard? Yeah, I think across the board, you know, not specific to any one company, I think people are recognizing that people can be productive in a variety of work locations. I happen to work in an industry and in a business that... I spend more time out and my team spends more time out and engaging with the public and uh, with uh, community partners, you know, so we're, we're out anyway. And I almost everywhere that I've worked, even when I worked in the Capitol, when I worked in the Senate and I had a team of 12 professionals who worked for me, I didn't expect them to be sitting at their desk all day long anyway. Right. And my message then and, and now was, we know the job that needs to be done. And as long as we're getting that job done, I don't care whether you're sitting in a seat or punching a clock or, you know, whatever the case may be. You know, on the flip side of that, if there are performance issues, you want to like peel that back, right? You want to peel back and say, hey, am I seeing a dip in performance because a person is in a remote work situation? So I'm going to be intentional about coming to the office three days a week when I'm there, like you to be there and let's see if that makes a difference, right? Like those are some, some strategies that I've talked about with some of, you know, my peers and colleagues about what, what works for them when they have, when they run into situations like that, because it's not always the work arrangement that is causing the performance issues. It could be any, any number of things, but you obviously want to peel that back and test different strategies to, to tease it out and, and figure out what's going on. Do you give more trust as people earn it or do they start with a level of trust and can only go backward from there? Oh, it's definitely the latter. It's definitely the latter. I know that it was hard for me to get where I am in any job I've ever had. I assume the same for the people who I'm working with, whether they are work for me or are my peers. So there's a level of trust that is there. And, you know, I, I know 
you, you probably have heard this, you know, that trust is hard to gain and easy to lose. So you give them the trust and you, you know, you give them the room to work. And yeah, it's only when there's, you know, something that happened is, you know, things are not always fatal. Mistakes are not always fatal. We can pretty much always work our way out of a, a of a mistake or a situation or some corrective action can be put in place. I'd rather let people feel that they can make mistakes, not because there's some reason to not trust them. Maybe they're taking a risk, right? Maybe, you know, there's a lot that can be happening there. Um, so you don't you don't necessarily lose lose my trust because you made a mistake. We peel it back and we figure out what the what caused it. Then, yeah, okay. If there is something that is specific, there is some training issue, there is some development issue, there is some knowledge gap that needs to be addressed. Fine, we'll do it. And we know your thoughts from episode four about long game, about pattern and practice. Was it an aberrant behavior, or has it become part of something I've seen over and over? That really impacted my thinking, frankly, and even my coaching. It's come out of my mouth. Sometimes I give you credit. Sometimes I take credit myself. To say, you know, A, take a long game uh, and B, look for pattern and practice because one time is not fatal. Two times is not great. Three times is probably fatal if it's the same type of thing. What about leverage in today's market? I'm seeing as a coach and I find myself um, noticing difference between pu my public sector clients, my private sector clients. In the public sector, it's really hard to get rid of people. You can move them over and sometimes down, but it's really hard to fire people, for example. In the private sector, what I normally say to somebody is, we can't have that. You got to move them on. You got to move them up, out, over, but probably fire them. But boy, oh boy, it's really hard to replace these people. And so there's a real leverage in that, both given the job market and you know how long it takes to train people. So what are you seeing leverage was? Well, with employees and you as the employer in this case. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, where you stand also depends on where you sit. And I'm sure if you're an employee, you don't feel like you have a lot of leverage. As a manager, I feel like my employees have a lot of leverage. And I'm not, again, not specific to my current role, but I mean, I can actually use an example from the government, actually, Nick, where I was in a government, one of my government positions, I had uh, a person whose performance was, it wasn't cutting it. it you're right. It wasn't easy to, you know, find another place where they could, uh, you know, I'm being generous here, but find another place where they could be successful. It wasn't easy. It wasn't because of like bureaucratic rules about hiring and firing and documentation and stuff. Yeah, that's all. We all get that. And you got to you got to deal with that in public and private sector, frankly, because of just the law. But there was a different sort of pressure. There was a different sort of, you know, thinking that went into it. It's like, okay, how do we do this in a way that will not cause, you know, whether it's political uh, challenges or perception challenges or whatever the case may be, right? There's a constituency that may be supporting, you know, this particular person that we have to be mindful. Like, there's all kinds of things that come into play, right? So there's 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 those challenges in the public. On the private other sector, kind of politics at work. The other kind of politics at work, exactly. And then, but then in the private sector, yeah, it's like do you let somebody go. And it may be months before you can fill that position. And so you're left with is, are the performance issues so bad that they are worse than not having anybody at all? And, and then like, you have to do that calculation, like how long can I ride this out? And which is actually, you might say, not a bad thing, because, you know, when you make a decision like that, it's pretty significant. And it's a, it's a door you're going to go through that's going to have consequences. And so it should be tough. And you should evaluate that question. Are we better off with no one? And secondly, what would it take for us to get to the root of the performance issues, do some development and coaching, and see if we can make some progress, right? And how long are we willing to, to take that on? And it's, you know, it's a risk proposition, right? It's like, what is, what is the work imperative? What is, what is it that needs to get done? How much time do we have and what, what can we do? But again, you know, it just, it's, it's not, it's not easy in either situation. If you had somebody sitting there ready to go, you know, it's a different game, right? It's like, okay. And we've all been in that situation where we, yeah, it's also rare. That's the case. That's right. It's really the case. We appreciate your time. If you like what you've heard so far, do me a favor and leave a five-star review and share with your friends. We'll be right back. The law firm of Shoals, Brick, and Rogaski and partner Michael Rogaski are at the top of my list of go-to teammates. 
I have worked with their office for more than a decade on legal matters involving labor and human resource issues, contracts, savvy strategies to collect from that occasional naughty client, wills and trusts for my family, and even buying and selling a business. It's exactly true what their slogan says, big firm result, small firm service. Contact partner Michael Rogaski by visiting sbrlawsd.com. OM Incorporated is my go-to agency for digital marketing. I work with partners Andrew Thorne and Jennifer Wiles every day to market my business coaching practice. I get about half my business from the aggressive digital marketing strategy they design and run. OM developed NickWarnerConsulting.com and integrated a targeted digital marketing plan that matches me to high quality clients. I'm also going to work with them on my 2023 rebrand campaign. Contact them at www dot om dash incorporated dot com so i want to say i'm about to start on rapid fire portion of this interview but i have two pages so it can't be rapid fire but i have a lot of next level things (laughs) that we go from the general to some more specific let's talk about team building and hiring what common traits are you looking for in individual contributors uh, and from your team overall but mostly individual contributors when you're building your teams yeah there are a couple of things that i look for one is someone who has what I will steal as a bias for action. They've got to be obviously, and it's, it's seeing evidence of that, right? When you're in the interview process, you're, you're looking for, you know, if you're doing an evidence-based interview, you're not asking where did you work and how did you like it? And that sort of thing. You're asking, tell me about a time when you dealt with this situation where you were confronted with having to make a decision without all the evidence. What did you do? How did it work out? What were the lessons that you learned, right? And again, it's like, I'm looking for bias for action. I'm not looking for somebody who gets it right every time. Because in a team situation, in almost every situation that I've, I've you know, managed in at a, at, a, at a high level, where there is a lot of scrutiny, there's a, you know, it's a highly demanding environment. Um, time is of the essence. All of those things, you can't have someone working who is always looking for direction. There's going to be times when you need direction, but, but, but you can't always be looking for direction. I think I'll give an example. It's like one of the things that I, when I know I hit it right with a, with, a, with a person on my team, who as an individual and as a member of the team, when they come to me, they say, here's the situation. I've run into a wall on this. I need your help. Here's how far I've gotten it. Here's what I'm thinking. What do you think? Is that the right way to think about it? That's one approach. That's the approach. I'm just going to like, spoiler alert, that's the approach I like. I was going to say, I love that approach. That's the only approach I'm good. That's right, right? The approach I don't like is knock, knock, knock. This came up and I don't know what to do. What should I do? And you're just like, okay, because here's what I assume, Nick, with my team. I assume that the only problems that walk into my office are the harder ones. They've dealt with stuff that I don't even, like I'm aware of it, I'm getting, and I know what's going on, but they're solving all the hard problems. They're solving all the problems they they can solve. And I have confidence in that. And you know, I assume that I expect that. When you walk in, and the, this happens, the higher up you go in any organization, the harder problems get dealt with at the top. But you can't, there's definitely a situation where this ain't working if what's coming in is, I. Ex- I expect you to at least have thought about this. What? Because my first question back is going to be, "What do I think? No, what do you think? What what thought have you given to how to address this? What what have you teased out in terms of what information have you gathered? What do you? What do we know? What do we not know? Uh, and based on that, what's the direction you're thinking we're going in? So, I think it's really important to try to find that kind of. And again, it's you know, it's to tease that out rather when you're when you're picking your talent. You want to be thinking about people who are going to have a bias for solving the issue. And it's not, it doesn't mean that you don't communicate. It doesn't mean you don't read people in and bring in the right team members and do all that work. It's not an individual thing. It's a, it's a mindset that you're looking for. Um, it's not a, I own this and I'm only going to do this and I alone can solve this. It's not that, but it is, what is that bias for getting it done, getting the right people in the room and figuring it out? you know, get setting a course and going. Yeah, this is good. This is, this is why we do this show. This is why I started together at the top. 
of ladies and gentlemen of the audience of Together at the Top, if you are an aspiring leader and an emerging leader and you only listen to one segment of one podcast this year, listen to this segment because uh, I would associate myself with every single thing you said and it's brilliantly said also. I like this evidence-based interview and I like um, a bias toward action. It's really good. What can You told us a little bit about what you can't have on your team. Say a little more um, outside of, of self-starter and action. What can't you have on your team? You know, I want people who take ownership too, but I don't want people who think that that means I hoard, take credit, I'm opportunistic in a negative way. And, it, you know, it, it's cliche as to say, you know, I want somebody who's a team player. Okay, well, that's just, that's a buzzword that papers over looking at the actual facts of what we're talking about, right? Like, you know, Oh, that person's not a team player because they don't do whatever. No, be specific about what it is, right? Like, I want people who share credit, for sure, who do their work, but, but, but acknowledge others who are doing their work. Because guess what happens when that happens? My experience is it makes other people want to work with them. And those two people working together are better than them working individually, especially cutting each other down. But if you're thinking to yourself, the only way that I'm going to move up is to make everybody else look bad and to take credit for everything when even though I know other people have helped, that's not a good character trait on my part. So if I'm asking, wow, this is great. How did this happen? I do want to hear a lot of eyes. I did this. I initiated this. I, I, ex I expect to hear that. But I also expect to hear, you know, situations where you brought in other members of the team where there was a gap, you tried to figure out who could fill it and they, you know, you welcomed their participation in making it happen, right? So I'm gonna say this, Nick, the reason why it's disruptive to the workplace and to the team is because it builds resentment, it lowers morale, it's a negative draw on the work of the team. And so I just, that's, that's what I can't have. Really good, actually really bad, but good to know how you're thinking about it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Let's talk about negotiations. And this is one of the topics I struggle with how to stage into with you. I've been in some negotiations with you, some tough negotiations that lasted even five years at times. I know you've been in many, many, many more that I know nothing about. What is your general mindset going in? You know, any tips or mechanisms? Again, I'm a little uh, stumbly how I get into it because there's so much there. I'm not even sure how to ask the question, but what are your thoughts about negotiations and what makes you different? Yeah, I don't know. If, I don't know what makes me different to start with that question, but I and, and I this is the thing where I wish I could give, give credit to where I came up with this. When I was in grad school at the Kennedy School, I took the Harvard negotiation program. So this is probably where it came from. But I, I used I've used it, I feel like most of my career and obviously not everybody's going to have access to that. Uh, but there are books written by some of those professors that I, I highly recommend on negotiation. And the way it has translated for me throughout is, and I also use this as, a, you know, the time that I spent practicing law and preparing for, for trial, you always prepare the other side's case. And it's, it's more than just standing in somebody else's shoes, right? It is taking their position and legit forcing yourself to take their position and make their arguments and then figure out for yourself in terms of where you're coming from, what you're going to do to respond to that or how you're going to play on that. Frankly, I think, I don't remember if we talked about this, but during um, the um, negotiations around California, um, I'll say it updating its police use of force law, I had two sides, right? I, you know, sorry if this is repetitive, but some of you may, may not have heard it. The first is we had two sides. We had, so quote unquote, the law enforcement community who legit was saying, these guys have a tough job out there and we're going to, we're about to make it tougher. And on the other side, you had, uh, whether it was the ACLU, the legal community, the, you know, advocate community out there saying people are, are, are overstepping their bounds. They're moving too quickly and it's costing people their lives. Those are both very, very legitimate concerns, right? But and I'll just use one example. At one point, I'm putting myself in the position of the attorneys advocating for the reform, and they're proposing things that if it weren't police officers, they would be unalterably opposed to it. 
Like, wait, so you're telling me that you're going to remove a defense from a criminal defendant? Like, that's your argument. And then when you, when you, when you, when I said those things, that's when it's like, okay, got rid of that big thorny problem that the other side was like, this is, you know, this is a non-starter. And it, and so how do you, you identify those things? But, you know, you know, so in any negotiation you're going in and you're thinking to yourself, what are they thinking? How are they approaching this? And it's not easy to, to do it, but with practice and time and, and preparation, you can start to kind of chip at it and get some idea of what it is that you're going into and what's happening on the other side of the table that will you'll be better prepared. If anything, you'll have some empathy. You'll have some breakthrough on a human level because you understand where they're coming from and you can even articulate that in the right moment. But, you know, in order you know, to, to sort of advance ultimately your, your position and where you're coming from. I haven't been in probably a tenth or five percent of the negotiations you've been in, but the parts I have observed, and you can't always do this with a person, but you've used your personal relationships. You talk about preparing the other side's argument to really understand in depth. I might use the phrase pre-debate testing. I'm going out for a debate and I want you to fire every tough question at me because I know it's coming. So you can't always ask the person on the other side, but my guess is most negotiations, if you're going to use the Anthony Williams slash Kennedy school, uh, schools of thought, you can find somebody that's of that way of thinking that's in that community, even if it's not the person or the entity and come in with a lot of empathy. And it's not empathy to give somebody a hug. It's empathy. So I really understand inside out what the issues are on both sides and the best people I've seen at the business benefit from their network and the trust they come in with because they get unvarnished information from the quote unquote other side going into the negotiations. That's right. That's right. I mean, you, you, you hit the nail on the head, Nick. And one of the things that I think people don't often think about that I do is a negotiation is not a contest of who's going to win and who's going to lose. The reason you're in a negotiation is because it's going to require an agreement. It's not an election where one candidate is going to beat the other. They don't have to reach an agreement on, on you know, who's going to be in that position. They're both competing. It's a zero-sum game. One's going to win. One's going to lose. In a negotiation, the reason why you are in a negotiation is because it requires an agreement. Because if you could just bull over them or whatever, I mean or somebody else had to was going to make the decision to be different. So but be, because it is something that is going to require agreement and agreement, you have to approach it very differently. You have to see that person's other, you have to think about those things and you have to prepare yourself for that. Real, really good. Not just for our listeners, but for me, I, I really appreciate all that. Uh, let's switch gears just a little bit. How do young people catch your attention? Uh, how do they earn in with you? And then once you see it, what might you do about it? Oh man, I love this because for me, it's it's you know the way we continue to grow is to find those folks and bring them in, and it's not easy. There are few opportunities to to bring people in, and there's always more more people than you have slots for. But how do they get you? How do they get my attention? What I appreciate is someone who has the the I guess you could just call it guts, confidence to reach out. It's not a small thing to hear someone speak. Say you, you know, you're a young person out there and you're you're listening to this and you, you know, you you're at an event and someone just really strikes you. And you say to yourself, boy, I, I'd love to, you know, grab coffee with them, or I'd love to stay in touch with them or meet that person or whatever the case is. But, but you go, oh, they must be so busy. They're so important. They got some important job. I'll never do it. That's like, that's a huge mistake because guess what? If you, it's like not applying for a job, you definitely didn't get it. You know, if you don't reach out, you don't, you know, make the effort, then yeah, you're going to go on. It's going to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you do, you take the risk to reach out and then they're busy. Guess what? It may take a little while, but you ping them again say, Hey, just checking in. Wanted to see, you know, I, I read this interesting article I wanted to share with you it was related to what I heard you talk about. Those kinds of things get you on people's radar screen. When a young person does that, it does it. It, it takes something, but not the world, to send a note to to ping somebody on LinkedIn to you know anything like that that shows some sort of follow through. And but then and then that's the next thing is the follow through. There's there's a young woman who is like one of the most impressive people that I 
have come into contact in recent years who reached out to a top exec and said, hey, I want to take a walk and just get 15 minutes of your time. I, I see your, you know, or, or where are you going? You're going to your next meeting. Do you mind if I walk with you? You see somebody on the street. You, do you mind if I just, you know, what else are you doing? Like, if, you know, if you got something to do, it's fine. But, but that kind of initiative and that kind of guts to kind of do that shows a commitment. It shows some confidence uh, in themselves to be able to do that. Anyway, those are the kinds of things that get get my attention with with young folks. Yeah, I, I recently uh, spoke at, at Cal Berkeley, at UC Berkeley, and it was a combination of the engineering school and the business school together hired me to do a workshop. And the kids had a lot of questions, and several of them followed up on LinkedIn, and a couple of them called me and actually stayed an extra hour because we were they were so engaging, not because I was so engaging. But one of the main questions they had is, why would anybody care? I'm 19 or 20 or 21. Why would Anthony Williams or Nick Warner take a meeting with me. And you said something um, it really interesting about bringing these people in because it's a way for us to grow as well. And I hadn't thought about that. The answer I gave them was understand we had mentors too. And, and most of us really appreciate it. And we're looking for a way to give back. And if you're earnest, which for me is the litmus test, because I'm not going to do it for you. It's not get a hold of me. And I tell you, and I avail you of the keys to the kingdom. But if you're earnest and you're really trying, you'll get my attention and I'll give you that time because someone did it for me and I'm happy to play it back. And then I want to make sure I remind myself more and more of what you said, which is it ends up bringing a lot of value to me. I can't tell you how much I learned at Berkeley. I don't know what 20 year olds think about and I don't know all their concerns. And so that was really helpful. And they infused a couple of thoughts in me, more than a couple, where I drove home, you know, kind of rubbing my chin thinking, boy, I hadn't thought about it from that standpoint. So it does bring a lot to us as well. We appreciate your time. If you like what you've heard so far, do me a favor and leave a five-star review and share with your friends. We'll be right back. Kathy Olson at Ships and Trips makes travel planning so easy. She says she's a travel agent, but I experience her more like a travel concierge. Kathy has helped my family and friends plan countless trips over the years. She always puts in the extra effort, even calling local shops to find us off the beaten path snowmobile tours, local accommodations, or even to call in advance to make sure our rooms are correct. We love working with Kathy. Call her at 209-518-1625 or email Kathy with a C at shipsandtrips.com. The video Three Bridges Consulting produced for nickwarnerconsulting.com has increased my sales and the quality of the leads I get. Three Bridges believes defining and then telling a company's story to the right audience is the most important step in a successful marketing plan. It's not uncommon for a new client to tell me the video on my website was the reason they called me. These guys really know how to use video to help you sell your services. Contact Dennis Williams or Sean Springman by visiting www.threebridgesconsulting.co. You've been in a lot of top jobs, Anthony, you know, as we mentioned at the top and it has come up and I always tend to think you're going to be there forever, not for a politician, for example, because they have a shelf life to them. But I've been constantly throughout the years, I've been blessed to know you surprised by you saying yes to jobs when you were really involved and probably had no intention of leaving either the law firm or the courts or Boeing. How do, what gets your attention and how um, does anybody get your attention at that level, especially to leave something so meaningful to do something else equally or more meaningful? What are you looking for? Yeah, uh, that's a good. I mean, it's all it's often a combination of things. Um, and I'll, I'll, I mean, I guess I'll just use my most recent example of going from the governor's office to uh, to Amazon. And I, many people know who sort of followed my background and friends like you know people that I've, I've known in the business. You're one of them for a long time and have seen that path that you just described the, you know, I'm in a successful, interesting position here, go do something else, come back. And I'm what I've, the comeback has always been to come back to the public sector. I love the work. I love the challenge. I was talking to somebody who recently was announced to uh, leave, you know, a, a nice, well-paying private sector job to go back into government. I can tell you at a, at a high level, whether you're a chief of staff to a governor or or a legislative affairs secretary to a governor, these are not easy jobs. We don't we don't do them. <laughs> we certainly don't do them for the money. We don't do it for the power. Um, I know people think, oh my God, well yeah, it's easy to go do that because you know you're going to have all this power. Well, you know, there's a lot uh, that you give up 
when you when you make those choices. But it's that sense of contributing. It's that sense of, you know, it's probably a reason why a lot of people do run for office too, who have successful careers outside. There is a passion to try to, to do so. I can't describe it where it comes from, but it's there and you just have to acknowledge it. And so I'm hiding under the covers for the next, you know, call to service because it's hard, it's hard to say no. And I'm not putting anything out there, but that's just the fact. It's people can look at my history and see that it's hard to say no to those kinds of things. But why I chose the Boeing job, why I went to Amazon is a different side of that challenge coin. This was an area for me, Boeing was, I didn't, I hadn't had, I hadn't had that, that corporate experience. I hadn't, you know, I'd studied it some business government relationship. I had a sense of it, but I didn't really know. And I'd obviously worked with people who worked for large companies. I didn't really understand how, how it quote unquote worked. That was great. A great experience. Better experience is where I am now, where there's challenges. There's a lot of talent where I am. I feel a sense of like purpose and accomplishment that, you know, is fulfilling. And that, you know, as I've matured in this career of mine, that's more of what I'm looking for. You know, just um, we want to be continuously challenged. We want to, we want to, you know, while we know that not every moment is going to be fulfilling, um, there's tedious moments, there's moments of turn, whatever the case may be, the larger part of what we're doing is making a difference in some positive way and feeling challenged to solve difficult problems or to overcome some protracted battle or issue on something. That's what I'm looking for. That's kind of what I'm I'm motivated by, um, you know, when I've made these moves. And I keep thinking that someday... I'm going to quote unquote retire and I'm going to teach because back to the thing you were saying, I love teaching because you, it's like, a, it's like, you know, plugging into a charger. I mean, it just like being in the room with these bright minds and, you know, who are eager and who are questioning and who are pushing you. Um, so I, I do see that out in the horizon somewhere. I hope it happens, but until then I'm just, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing. All right. Well, that's the roadmap for how to keep Anthony or get Anthony. There it is. Um, okay. So before we get to what you're excited about in the future, and I summarize some of the really in interesting and salient points you brought up, I want to talk just briefly or hear your thoughts briefly on the role of family and all you've been able to do. And um, where does family play in into, into the process and your ability to do things or maybe not do things? It definitely is both those things. I mean, I can't imagine being able to do what I've done for the last 16 years without uh, my wife, Keiko, the support that she's provided to the family and me and, you know, obviously our kids and it's pretty extraordinary. So I've got these young adolescents and preteens that are at a point in their life where they need a lot of daddy. And um, frankly, daddy's traveling a lot and it, you know, that's tough right? It's, you know, it's great that we have FaceTime, but it ain't the same thing as, you know, hug time at bedtime, you know? So there is a limit that I put on myself professionally, because that is priority number one. And as much uh, runway as I'm given because of the support and the foundation that I have, I know that I can't outrun it. And I, you know, just, you just can't. The consequences of, of, those not being there, um, not being present. And that's the important thing is it's both being there and being present. And it's, you know, that can be hard to do because, you know, you're stressed, you had a long day, you're stressed. The first thing I want to do is get home and fire up a cigar and relax. But, you know, the boys need time. They need daddy time and you got to give it to them. You see me shaking my head because I made a lot of mistakes in that area and I needed my kids to point out, daddy, I keep seeing the top of your head in your phone. Or Katie says, uh, you know, you're having almost all of those conversations with uh, your kids that are seeing the top of your head or you're talking to somebody else. You were at the game. What was the score? I have no idea. I was on the phone the whole time. I was there, but I wasn't present. I'm really glad you brought that up. Exactly. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up. Hey, and the little bit of time we have left, and this this is probably a whole nother topic on its own, but, you know, a lot of our nation's uh, leaders, be it business or professional, or I should say political, or they're disruptors. Elon Musk, Mark Cuban, Barack Obama, even the toxic Donald Trump. How do you distinguish the possibility of positive disruptions or disruptors from acidic and non-productive or visionary and dangerous? Wow, that's that's a tough question. I mean, it's a good question. You know, what it comes back to is in some ways the I don't want to say the motive, 
but in, that's the only word that comes to mind. Like, what is the what is what is it that you're seeking? What is it that you're after, right? In doing this, if you're you know Jeff Bezos and you're disrupting the retail marketplace, you're not doing it because you think you want to, you know you're doing something bad or you just you don't like retail. You're doing it because you think that's what customers want, right? You think it's providing a service and a convenience, frankly, that people want and need as we came to see during the pandemic. If you're Elon Musk and you uh, have seen, and, and it, it was really the, the folks who were behind Tesla, even before Elon Musk was behind Tesla, who came up with the idea that you could have a high performance luxury vehicle that was fully electric. When at that time, you had these things that could only go 30 miles at 30 miles an hour, right? And it wasn't because they hated automobiles that were gasoline powered. It was because they thought people, you know, so that's what's inspiring to me when you think about what is the positive trajectory that a disruptor is looking to do? What is the kind of, you know, change that they're trying to bring about? And sometimes it's hard to see that. I mean, you mentioned Donald Trump. I don't know what I can say about Donald Trump other than, you know, I, it's you're right. I mean, he has disrupted politics and it's caused people to participate and pay attention in a way that may be painful. But I think the jury's still out on what the impact of that will be. So I, I you know, generally favor disruption. Right. It's how we get progress. Yeah. You, you know, you mentioned that pre-production. It really caught my attention. The way you said it surprised me a little bit. So I started thinking about, you know, different disruptors. And I started thinking about toxic versus productive. So to hear you say I'm, pro, you know, I'm pro disruptor, but the motive part is really interesting that to me, I will probably adopt that for my own disruptor. But what's your motive to get people better transportation, to make it easier for me to buy things and arguably cheaper for me to buy things employs lots of people. Yeah, I mean, the, the motive, ascribing a motive is a really interesting way. I mean, almost a simple way to, to um, for me to score good, bad, toxic, or just, just disruptive. Yeah, yeah. Is it, dis is it disruption? Is it disruption for, for progress or is it re uh, disruption to stop progress? I mean, I, you know. I, was... I use the word toxic. You didn't use the word toxic. I did. I use the word toxic. Cause... You're throwing bombs because you don't, you don't, you don't want to see the growth. That's, you know. So, Anthony, tell us what you're excited about and where we can find you. I am on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn. That's about it. At my, you know, I feel like at my generation, I feel I trying to figure out how to do Instagram. I'm just not there yet, folks. I may be soon, but um, I'll start with that. Which, you know, where you can find me is um, on LinkedIn and at a Cal Williams on Twitter. Pretty easy. I talked about this a little bit, Nick. It's not going to surprise you. Is that I just am constantly curious and learning, trying to learn in my time of in my downtime, wind down time, relaxation. If, if I'm not enjoying cigars with, with good friends, I am right now I'm reading basic economics by Thomas Sowell, which is like probably in its fifth edition. Now. Um, I don't remember when it was first published, but I really started getting curious about how uh, we are viewing the world and the economy. And just, I felt like I needed to go back to some basics and it's one of the best uh, books I, uh, you know, researched and 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 saw uh, comments on that put it in pretty easy to understand terms. Believe it or not, it's a five six hundred page book on economics with no charts and graphs. It's brilliantly written. It's very very consumable. So, yeah, just you know, I'm ever curious. I would encourage people to find those things that you're curious about and explore them a little bit, take some time. It's very, you know, to me, it's, it's really fulfilling to do that. I love curiosity. You had me at curiosity, constant curiosity. Yep. I was going to say, normally I say, this is my favorite part of the show where I summarize you back to you for benefit of the audience. At least I hope benefit of the audience okay. in this particular case, from the very beginning until this part was my favorite part. So this is just a part. Um, some of the things you covered that really caught my attention informed by reading, and part of the reason it catches my attention is, Anthony, I mean, you're a humble guy, but by any measure, you're a stratospherically successful. And by reading through learning, you've decided, I don't know it all. I don't even know close to it all. Constantly pushing yourself through humans and through reading. Uh, and I think that's really worth taking note of, including you, including you mentioned some actual books. You know, we started talking about different generations and hiring and teams. And, and you're one person, and not everybody thinks the same way you do, but you're an impactful person. So knowing you're thinking about 
lack of tolerance for tolerance and and you're seeing you use the word um the society is becoming more uh more tolerant or less tolerant of intolerance and also your um insistence on treating different people different ways based on what they need so i might use the example of a little league coach who brings like the exact same style to every kid maybe it's a hard out style for example which could be true at work and a third of the kids are crying a third of the kids are hustling their tail off and a third of the kids have no idea what you're talking about so whether it's different generations or different personality types your willingness to see the difference and then essentially coach or employ to the difference i think is great and it goes right with two ears one mouth a little bit more listening can lead to a lot more understanding, which I think is a real super strength of yours. Um, I can only aspire to be as good of a listener as you are. And then taking the listening and doing something with it, having that be actionable. We talk about um, a, a predisposition to action, but listening and then tailoring your approach based on what you heard to different people. It's not just Anthony's way. You're reading, you're listening, you're adjusting. I think that's great. Two ears and one mouth. You use the term progressing as humanity. That's a term I was looking for, and I love that so much. And the reason I do is I'm not Pollyanna, and I don't think you are either. But if you're going to tell me you think we're progressing as a society and you can back it up, which you have in some neat ways, I'm for that. Because we can easily document ways we're regressing as a society, and I don't think it's universal. So you taking a minute to point out where you see lack of tolerance for intolerance is one example of where we're making progress as a human race I think is really neat. I was really struck by... Uh, leverage in the workplace because you said I feel like they have leverage but I bet they don't feel like they have leverage and you know even to the negotiation point that's a really good point I hadn't thought about it that way because at times I'm either advising or I'm talking to somebody that works for me I'm thinking boy I'm on the line I really don't want him to leave but they're probably not thinking that they're thinking I hope he doesn't fire me exactly <laughs> so that was a good uh, so good, good for me to remember that <laughs> Perception of reality and reality um, could be different things. I said before, I really like this thought and this term of bias for action. I'm going to keep that on my own. I'm going to take that for my own, I should say. Always preparing the other side's position. If if I've coached you, if you've worked for me, I am huge on pre-debate testing. I actually like your phraseology better. And it's not just because it sounds good, it's because it portends something and it drives an action. Let's prepare the other side's case. Right. And let's get input from the other side, either from the actual actor, which is not usually possible, um, or from somebody in that community so we can really understand. And then one of the smartest things you said in a, in a sea of smart things is that the whole point of a negotiation, unlike an election, you said, is to reach agreement. I will just tell you, I've never thought about it that way before. The whole point of us being in this meeting is at some point, it could be today, it could be five years from today, but we have to land this plane and reach agreement. Right. But one of the phrases I learned in that Harvard negotiation project was BATNA, best alternative to a negotiated agreement. If your best alternative is to not negotiate and have agreement, then go do that. Right. Like that's why you're in the room to try to do to do better. Yeah, well said. It's a it's a great not not only um reminder, but to me it's a different way of thinking about it. It's not a reminder. It's actually a different and refreshed way to think about it. And words matter again because they dictate action, at least for me and for the people I want to work with, they do. Talking about younger people, I really need and I think maybe we know this. I've really experienced as a coach more than more than anything. I want to mentor young people because I want to give back, but boy, does it bring a lot to me. I always stretch my perspective. It's a different type of diversity that we don't talk about enough is age diversity and generational diversity. It tends to light me up and just refresh me. But also, um, like you said, or alluded to, and like I said, every single time they say something I'd never considered before. At Berkeley, they asked me, how do employers think about tattoos? How do I network with somebody when I don't bring anything to the table? How do I work a job fair, which I actually hadn't ever thought of before? They gave me input, not me, them. How do I even talk about a raise? My boss is so busy. How do I ever walk in their office? You and I don't talk about those things because we are the bosses, but they do. And so it really helps us both as humans and as managers to understand their pressure points. And then one of my big takeaways, final takeaway, this is going to help me a lot and help others in, in analyzing and deconstructing disruptive behavior for the purpose of toxic or power for power or disruptive because the motive is good. Whether you agree or not, the intent is good. And for me, I'm going to take that as a way to separate and make a distinction between toxic and um, and productive, even if it is disruptive to be productive. That's great. Any closing thoughts? I just thank you, Nick. I thank your uh, your listeners. I am a member of your audience too. I'm always looking forward to your 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 next guest, and I hope uh, 
our conversation has been helpful to to folks and um particularly you know any any one of your your folks in the audience i i do hope they they use a mechanism to reach out but you know like we said in particular those folks who are either young in their career or thinking about something new and different um and want to reach out please please do that thank you i I must tell you that our our professional friendship is one of the most enriching things I have in my life. I constantly learn from you. I look up to you, to be honest. Um, I consider you a mentor, even if we're contemporaries, and it's really an honor to have you on the show. So with that, I'll say, Anthony Williams, you've done an amazing job, and we're grateful for your time and insights. I also want to take time to thank my awesome researcher, Anna Padalinko, and her outstanding production crew led by Daniel Link, Jimmy Brannon, and Riley Byrne at Podigy Podcast Productions. Join us next month for another episode of Together at the Top. Thank you so much for your time. Together at the Top thrives off listeners like you. To stay connected, follow our socials in the show notes and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. We will be releasing our show on the last Tuesday of every month. See you next time. At Nick Warner Consulting, we exist to coach and consult motivated professionals. I meet with you on Zoom in focused 90-minute sessions, working toward your goals and developing next-level business skill sets. My job is to add value to your organization and your career. To learn more, visit www.nickwarnerconsulting.com or call me directly at 916-765-3576.